Good afternoon. I hope all of you, uh, you are the veterans. Everyone in this room receives a uh, red background under their paratrooper wings. And you joined those who jumped to the Mitla Pass in 1956. Those are the only ones in Israel who had a combat parachute jump. Okay, and that's because you're here after four days of deliberations and you haven't gotten tired. You still want more of this, which is a really good sign. Okay, because uh, this, uh, this afternoon, we have a great debate taking place. It's a debate taking place on the definition of what terrorism actually is, which is, uh, and practically in every workshop and in every one of the plenary sessions, at the end of the day, it's always been, okay, what is terrorism and how do we define it? So basically, um, one of those individuals who's going to be speaking about the definition of terrorism is the ultimate counter-terrorist of the State of Israel. Depends if you know him too personally, sometimes a terrorist, but <laughs> he's the tallest counter-terrorist I know in the audience. <laughs> His name is Professor Boz Ganor, and as you know, he's the dean of the Loder School of Government and Diplomacy and the founder of this institute. And uh, more power to him and Stevie and the whole team here who have been running the show in an amazing way. His adversary is Colonel Reserve's advocate, Daniel Reisner. I'll elaborate a little bit more about Reisner's background because some of you may not know um, who he is and I think it's important to elaborate. Um, and then Professor Ganor is gonna come up here and then he's going to invite advocate Reisner up here and then we will have uh, the debate according to the medieval laws of chivalry. So that if this, uh, if this debate takes place later than Saturday night, and it's Sunday, in medieval times, we never ha held battle on Sunday. So I have to take a day off and continue on Monday, right? No problem. So Colonel Reserve's advocate, Daniel Reisner, Associate ICT, IDC Herzliya, and former head of the International Law Department of the IDF, uh, Daniel served as a legal advisor in the Israel Defense Force Military Advocate General's Corps for 19 years. And between 1995 and 2004, he held the position of head of the International Law Department. In this capacity, Reisner was responsible for advising the IDF General Staff and other senior IDF officers, the Ministry of Defense, and the Prime Minister's Office on issues including Israel's activities vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians and neighboring Arab states, international law, counterterrorism operations, and Mideast peace process. In addition to the above, between 94 and 2000, Reisner served as a senior member of Israel's peace de delegation with both Jordan and the Palestinians, working in the triple role of negotiator, legal advisor, and drafter. In this capacity, Daniel Reisner advised, advised Prime Ministers Rabin, Perez, Netanyahu, and Barak. For that, by the way, you deserve a double, uh, <laughs> a double paratrooper wink, okay? It's like 100 jumps. 50 jumps is a star, you get, you get two stars, okay? And, uh, and participated in all of the negotiation sessions and summits, including those in Amman, Y River Camp, David, and Taba. In 2005, he opened his own law firm, specializing in representing international clients in their business activities, both in Israel and abroad. And parallel to his professional career, Daniel Reisner has pursued active academic activity, is widely publishing, and is sought after as a lecturer and panelist. He is currently a fellow in two of Israel's leading private research centers, teaches in several universities, and continues to advise senior members of the Israeli government on issues related to the Middle East process. All of those who, of us who have been involved in the Israel Defense Force, a person like Reisner is in many ways a bodyguard. A bodyguard, a person who makes sense, a person who deals with all of those aspects which, which uh, are no less important than the actual battlefield itself. And uh, thank you for coming this afternoon. How much is he charging you, boss? He's now in the private sector. <laughs> He's a lawyer, so don't shake hands with him. Because you may have to count your fingers afterwards. Okay, Professor Ganor, stage is yours. Well, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think what is the best uh, definition for myself after this evening, I think uh, 
a suicider is probably the right term. Um, you know, we thought uh, what would be the best way to conclude the conference. Um, in many previous conferences, we concluded them with simulations, uh, wargaming, and so on and so forth. Uh, we want something that will have a content, but also will be, in a way, amusing. So what is more amusing than two gladiators fighting each other? That's practically what uh, we decided to do here. Uh, some would say that I misused the platform being the uh, head of the institute. I uh, took Occupy, this specific uh, time frame of the end of the conference, in order to present to you something which is very, very close to my heart, and that's the definition of terrorism. Probably you would be right if you would claim that, but I have to say to my defense that I uh, have chosen the best uh, uh, person and uh, the worst, from my point of view, uh, to uh, uh, debate with me, uh, one of the, the best world uh, jurists that not necessarily see eye to eye uh, the way uh, I would like to present to you the definition of terrorism. It doesn't necessarily see it eye to eye uh, with me. For the last uh, more than 30 years, I'm trying to persuade whoever is ready to listen and uh, not many are ready to listen, uh, that A, there is a need for an international objective definition for the term, for the phenomenon terrorism, and B, that it's possible to reach an agreement um, worldwide. Well, the only thing that I really succeeded is uh, to get or to uh, make people believe that I'm either naive or stupid or uh, Don Quixote, uh, who knows. Uh, I can tell you that it's not uh, very pleasant to be, uh, uh, to be a minority and to be insignific insignificant minority within this, uh, uh, the scholarly community uh, and even the uh, political community and, uh, and the security community believing in these two uh, arguments that it's possible and it's uh, necessary to reach an agreement uh, on terrorism, on the definition of terrorism, but uh, I am not going to stop my efforts, and this is uh, one of the peaks of my efforts. So you can imagine that most of uh, the scholars, many of them are in this room, uh, believe that exactly the opposite. It's impossible to reach an agreement on definition of terrorism. So many people try to do so and never succeeded. And practically, there is no need to try because the international community function quite well and cooperate quite well without the definition of terrorism. The Israeli Mossad doesn't need a definition of terrorism in order to cooperate with the MI6 or the CIA or whoever. They don't really need that. And uh, the proof is in the pudding. They work together. They, they do joint uh, 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 activities and so on and so forth. And they don't need that. And I would argue that, yes, you can reach a level, a certain level of international cooperation counterterrorism today much better than it used to be in the past, but it's far from being enough in order to contend the current threats of terrorism, the current characteristic of terrorism, and definitely the future trends uh, of terrorism altogether. I would say that most of the criticizers, practically all of the criticizers uh, that don't believe that it's possible or needed to reach an agreement on definition of terrorism are using the very, very known slogan, which I believe that each and every one of the people in this room, students or uh, known uh, world scholars, know it by heart. And the slogan is the following one. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. I mean, we all know it. Probably we all believe in it, by the way, including myself, because it's true. Uh, for, uh, for the Turks, the Kurdish are conducting terrorist attacks. I'm not so sure that many Israelis refer to that as terrorism, but we refer to Hamas as terrorist organization, and uh, Turkey doesn't. The Russians see some of the Chechens as terrorists, but not Hezbollah. The Chinese refers to the Uyghurs as terrorists, but not necessarily the Americans, and so on and so forth. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Seems so natural, so true. And I would argue that although the slogan is probably a true uh, uh, statement, 
it's at the same time very dangerous and misleading. And I will try to explain that. Because the, uh, th this saying is practically mixing between two different concepts. The two different concepts is A, the modus operandi, and B, the goal. Freedom fighting or the fighting for the freedom is fighting for a goal. The goal is freedom. Terrorism is a certain modus operandi which is aimed in order to reach the goal. By the way, many goals, including one of them, might be freedom. That's why it's so misleading because it sounds well. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Anybody who fights against me is a terrorist. Anybody who's using the same modus operandi against my enemy is a freedom, fighting, a freedom fighter. But practically, it's two different subject matters altogether. Goals and modus operandi. The difference between terrorism and freedom fighting is not a subjective difference. It doesn't uh, has to do with your point of view. It has to do with either you are trying to achieve a certain goal and what are the measures that you are using in order to achieve those specific goals. And I think, and that is my effort, which I'll explain in a moment, that we can and we should persuade the international community to say a very simple thing. We would never, never ever agree on what is a just cause and on what is a legitimate goal. We would never agree if the Palestinians are freedom fighters or not, if they are fighting for the freedom or not, if the Kurds are fighting for the freedom or not. Israel would not agree on that with Turkey. But we can agree that even if you have a just cause, and even if you have a legitimate cause, there is a certain type of measure of violent activity that should be forbidden. This is terrorism. And in a minute I will define terrorism and you would understand that. Practically, what the international community should do is to resist the efforts of many Muslims around the world, and I refer mainly to the Muslim World League, in trying to uh, mix and to, and to mislead the international community. Let me read to you the uh, uh, one article from the Muslim World League definition on terrorism. This was published, by the way, in Durban, South Africa in 2001. The definition that I will suggest to you in one moment would hold hardly one line. The definition of the Muslim World League holds four pages. Okay? So I would read only one article from these four pages. Terrorism is an outrageous attack carried out either by individuals, groups, or states against the human being, and now they explain, against his religion, against his life, against his intellect. You know, I'm saying to the students in my class, if you're saying something stupid in the classroom, this is insulting my intellect, this is terrorism by this definition, okay? <laughs> So it's against his religion, against his life, against his intellect, against his property, or against his owner. I would adopt that tomorrow morning because it encapsulates everything. It includes, they explain, it includes all forms of intimidation, harm, threatening, killing, and this is the punchline, without a just cause. So if you have a just cause, you can do all of the above. You can kill, you can arson, you can extort because you have a just cause. No, my friends, there are no just causes that can justify terrorism under any condition. There is no good terrorism and there is no bad terrorism. There is only one thing which is the phenomenon of terrorism. So what is terrorism? What is the definition of terrorism? The definition of terrorism, the definition that I use, is terrorism is the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilian targets by non-state actors in order to achieve political ends. That's it. Short, short precise, and objective. Deliberate use of violence aimed against civilian targets by non-state actor, and I will explain each one of those arguments in a moment, in order to achieve political ends. Let's start from the last argument. 
in order to achieve political ends. Well, it needed to be designated for political ends because if you use violent activity for other purposes, this is not terrorism, this is criminal activity. The terrorists and the criminals are doing the same. They kill, they arson, they extort. But what makes a terrorist or the phenomenon as terrorism is the fact that this, this criminal act is being done for political purposes. Which political purposes? Any type that you have in mind. It could be socio-economical political uh, uh, purposes. It could be uh, nationalistic, separatistic. It could be holding extreme political ideologies, communism, fascism, anarchism. Or if you wish, it could be religious political grievances. Trying to create a caliphate state would therefore be a political religious grievances that leads to terrorism. So that's the political element. The second element is civilian targets. Well, yes, terrorism, I would argue, is aimed towards civilian targets, not against military targets. Now, you can imagine that I'm not that popular in Israel with this argument, nor in any other country for that matter, because what I'm saying practically is that the liberal use of violence aimed against uh, military targets, soldiers, is not terrorism. And that's what I think. Don't get me wrong. It's political violence. It's guerrilla warfare. It's insurgency. You can define that any way you want. But it's not terrorism because terrorism is secluded to the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilian targets. Again, don't get me wrong. Any state has the right, of course, to fight against any threat to their military targets, to their soldiers, to their officers. They have the right, if necessary, to kill the adversary before he would harm their military forces. But from the moral standing, from the moral point of view, I see a total difference between the liberties of violence aimed against military targets, i.e. guerrilla warfare or insurgency, and the liberties of violence aimed against civilian targets. That's the second pillar. Now, I was talking about non-state actors. One would say, wait a minute, this is, uh, this is not fair. Because uh, why do you exclude the uh, states? Does states more necessarily more moral than non-state actors, than organizations? Of course not. States might be much less moral. States might inflict much more harm on civilians than organizations because they have much more power, military power. But I don't need to define those atrocities which would be conducted by states deliberately against civilians uh, by using the word terrorism for that, because it already has been defined either as a war crimes or crimes against humanity. The paradox is that what we need right now is to define what those non-state actors are doing, and we're reluctant to do so. And uh, um, to explain this, this argument, I would like to say the following. If in this empty chair, we would have Ismail Ania, the leader of Hamas sitting, I can guarantee that what he would tell you is, I'm not a terrorist because I'm a freedom fighter. Might be that some people in this room, definitely many people around the world, believe his statement. Because he represents the Palestinians. The Palestinians, like it or not, are living under occupation. Israeli occupation. They want to achieve their freedom. They want to achieve their country. So he's a freedom fighter. Of course, as an Israeli, I see it differently. As an Israeli, I would argue that you are not trying to achieve your freedom and create your country. You are trying to destroy my country in order to achieve your freedom. And that's not a real freedom fighter. But forget about that. That's politics. Let's say, Mr. Ania, that you are genuinely a freedom fighter. So let me tell you something, Mr. Ania. Me, as Boaz Ganor, I support any freedom fighter in the world. Me, as Boaz Ganor, I believe that genuine freedom fighters has the right to use violence in order to achieve their freedom. But there is one type of violence which should be always forbidden. And that's the deliberate use of violence aimed against civilian targets. So from now on, Mr. Ania, you cannot say anymore, 
I'm not a terrorist because I'm a freedom fighter. Maybe you're a freedom fighter with 10 question marks, but you are definitely a terrorist while you deliberately attack civilians. Now, some people would say, what do you want from them? It's, a, it's not a strong organization. Do you really expect them to fight against armies? Of course they would cling to the uh, opportunity to attack civilian targets and not military targets because they're weak. It's not fair to ask them to uh, concentrate in deliberate attack against military targets. And I would say, well, not necessarily. I will answer this question, but let me raise another question against this argument that I've just gave you. Some people would say, you know what? It's an interesting academic theoretical drill, what you did right now. Even makes some sense for me. But it doesn't have any merit in real life. Because even if you would persuade me, or even if you persuade the government, any government, or all the governments, it, uh, it won't influence the, the way that terrorists are thinking. It won't influence the activities of the terrorists. They will keep on conducting those types of attacks. Why? Go, let's go back to the previous argument. Because it's beneficial for them. And I would like to argue, or to add another argument here, terrorists in general, definitely organized terrorism, terrorist organizations, are rational actors, i.e. terrorists are calculating costs and benefits. And they are choosing the alternative which they believe is more beneficial than costly. We are to blame. The international community is to blame. The Western countries are to blame. The scholarly community is to blame that we don't challenge them. We gave them this situation in which, regardless if they deliberately attack military target or civilian target, we would refer to them in the same manner. They will get the same punishment if they will be captured. They will be criticized in the same way in the international community. Those that would support them will keep on supporting them, regardless if it's terrorism or guerrilla warfare. We didn't challenge their cost-benefit calculations, but if the international community would adopt this definition, or any other definition for that matter, and then the international community would unite against them and would have conventions that forbid terrorism under this definition, that would force states not to support terrorists under this definition, that will put sanctions on states that uh, uh, support terrorists under this definition, the states would have to think twice. Think about Iran, that I think no, nobody can argue differently. A state, maybe the biggest state sponsor in the world, that support Hezbollah, that support Hamas, that support the Houthis, and so on and so forth. And if Iran will face a wall-to-wall -wall sanction because their support for terrorist organization, but at the same time, the international community would say, look, you hate Israel, fine. You want to destroy Israel, go for it. Why not? You want to support the Palestinians or the Shiites or the Houthis, go for it. But only if those organizations that you support deliberately attack military targets and not civilian targets. Because if it would be civilian targets, those people, those organizations would be the enemies of the world. Not the enemy of the other state, the enemy of the world. And you would have to pay for that. They would go to Hezbollah and Hamas and say, you want to attack Israel? Go for it. You want our $100 million? Go for it. We'll give it to you. But... Don't attack deliberately civilians. Now, I would argue that if I'm able, by the definition, to shift the fire from civilian targets into military targets, this is a huge success in counterterrorism. I would argue that if we would have this definition, and I would conclude with that, if we would have this definition accepted in the international community, then first time ever, we will be able to prevent incitement for terrorism. I mean, you know, in a retrospective point of view, after 30 years of efforts, how successful was I? Maybe I succeed to persuade Marcy Polier here, but not many other people altogether. I knew that uh, it might be some kind of naivete what I'm trying to do here. It's even clearer to me today. Probably I would never be able to persuade states to adopt this definition. Why? Because it's convenient for them. 
that there is no definition of terrorism. It's convenient for Turkey not to have a definition for terrorism. It's, for, for, it's, it's uh, very good for Israel, beneficial for Israel not to have a definition. The leaders doesn't want that because then they can have a photo opportunity where they have Putin, Schmutin, and all the rest <laughs> raising their hands in the head, and we are all united against terrorism. Great, but we don't define terrorism in the same way. So what's the merit of that? Nothing whatsoever. So I would not be able to persuade them. What occurred to me recently is that the best way, probably, to achieve this goal, which I wholeheartedly believe in it, is to go to the social net network providers, to Facebook, to Twitter, to Google, those which are being criticized, and rightly so, today, by the international community, by the leaders of those states, that they don't do what they need to do, not efficient enough in taking out incitement from Facebook, from Twitter, from Google. And those, I don't want to, uh, God forbid, to uh, def defend them. But they are coming to those states and say, fine, you want us to take out incitement for terrorism? So please tell us what is terrorism. And the states doesn't give them an answer. Yes. Anything that has to do with Al-Qaeda, anything that has to do with ISIS, that's the easy way out. Everybody agreed that ISIS and Al-Qaeda are bad guys. But this is not really fighting against incitement for terrorism. You cannot fight against incitement for terrorism if you don't agree what is terrorism. Last but not least, counterterrorism community today, and you had a workshop talking about that, is focusing on AI, getting in-depth to the uh, uh, artificial intelligence, to the big data world, to machine learning, to deep learning. Henry Kissinger wrote a very interesting article just a month ago. The title of the article was something along the line of the end of enlightenment. In this article, among many other things, he uh, he's criticizing AI in many fields, but especially in security, national security, counterterrorism. And he thinks there's something which is very interesting. He's giving an example of uh, an experience that was done um, in which two computers, actually uh, chatbots, the name of the chatbots was Thai, and the programmers uh, created those algorithms that taught those chatbots to have some kind of, of a conversation, developing conversation, and the only order that they get is to talk to each other as if they are non-aggressive females at the age of 19. It took it few hours until they became very aggressive. And then he asked the question, why? Why did it happen? What went wrong? The answer was, they cannot, the machine cannot educate itself not to be aggressive because there is no agreement worldwide what is aggressiveness and what is not. It's culture dependent. Uh, in one place, this type of behavior would be regarded aggressive. In other culture, it would not. So if you do not agree on a term, you cannot educate the machine to work by those ter terms. I would argue the same thing about terrorism. How can you teach a machine to find incitement for terrorism if you don't agree what terrorism is all about? So my friend, my gladiator, I know that I'm now going to be slapped from all over the way, the way so <laughs> go for it, Daniel. Lesson number one in how to win a debate, don't leave enough time for the other side. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and you got a bigger podium. Now, look. I have been teaching here at IDC now five, don't know how many years, and I teach the comparative, it's a class about how do democracies manage to balance between human rights and security considerations. And the first part of my class is, okay, what is terrorism? And so I come to the classroom and I see some survivors of my class in this room, and I say to them, okay guys, what is terrorism? And they give me this blank look. And then one says, well, the definition is, and they quote Boaz's definition. And then I said, no, that isn't the definition of terrorism. I said, but that's what Boaz taught. And I said, that's exactly what it is. It's what Boaz wants the definition of terrorism to be. And then I teach them what the definition of terrorism is. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
How do I know what the definition of terrorism is? Not because I invented it, but because all the countries in the world came up with their own definitions of terrorism, and there are a few thousands of them already out there. And one of the things you will notice if you study them, as well as I study them just as well as I have, is that they are all different. In fact, inside countries like the US, UK, and Israel, you will find numerous different definitions of the term terrorism inside the country between different organizations, different laws, different contexts. We don't have a uniform definition of terrorism globally. We don't even have, in many countries, a national uniform definition of terrorism. And the first question we need to ask ourselves is, why don't we have? And was mentioned a few of the reasons, and the summary of those reasons is because of the difference in perspectives and locations and ideologies, etc. We don't actually agree on the definition of terrorism. It's not a question of finding the truth. It's the fact that we actually disagree what terrorism is. Now, this is not unique to terrorism. You all remember the famous story about when the US Supreme Court was asked what the definition of pornography is. And a very smart American judge responded by saying, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. In many respects, we've been treating terrorism exactly the same thing. But another area I've been specializing in for the last 15 years is corruption. Now, the global fight against corruption and bribery is uniform. I mean, there are very few countries, putting aside certain countries with over 1 billion people, who take uh, 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 this and say, this is legitimate way of doing business. So. You would think we would all agree what corruption and bribery is, but if I were to give you the lecture about comparative definitions of bribery and corruption globally, you will discover that some countries like the US prohibit bribery. In fact, they invented the idea of prohibiting bribery, but still include some legislative exclusions. So for example, under US law, but not practice, but the law, if you come to a country and let's say uh, the customs officer makes a sign that he needs some money to let you through, and you pay him under US law, the letter of the law, that is not a bribe. Because you were actually paying him for something he would have done anyway. You're just expediting. So that's called an expediting payment. And the US law actually <laughs> exempts that, although the current, the Ministry of the Department of Justice in the US has come up and said, well, no, we don't allow you. In, in the UK, for example, uh, bribery also includes the private sector. So you are no longer allowed to give CEOs of companies perks because you may be influencing them into doing something, while in most of the world it's only public sector. But we all want to fight corruption and bribery, but we can't even agree on the definition. But we do have international conventions on fighting bribery, and actually they include definitions which not everyone agrees with. So there is an objective problem in defining something where we don't agree on what it is. And trying to force people to agree on something they don't agree about is usually an exercise in futility. So that is one reason why Boaz and us have had a long-term discussion about should we pursue this. But there's another reason why I think we should focus the discussion, and I actually think this is a really important discussion. Why do we really need a definition of terrorism? And there can only be one of two reasons. I will start with the first one. Why do we need definitions of any type of human behavior? Now as a lawyer I'm speaking, right? I mean, Boaz, you said correctly, uh, terrorists are murderers. Terrorists are terrorists you lost are their interest once you said, I'm talking like a lawyer right now. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> terrorists are murderers, terrorists are arsonists, terrorists are kidnappers. We have crimes for all of those. And by the way, those are not under dispute. So we know a murderer, the definition of murder, by the way, isn't even uniform globally, but it's close enough, right? And the same is true of, of a lot of other things. Why do we need that added layer? In addition, what is the difference between a regular criminal and a terrorist? It's not the what, it's the why. And it's the why we often don't even know because he's dead. Or he won't tell us. So we have to guess the why. So why do we need it? And you know what the answer is? Now, I've been doing counterterrorism now for 35 years, so we need it because we want to do something to terrorists that we wouldn't do to regular murderers. I invented something in the IDF 18 years ago, 
It's now called the targeted killing policy. And I invented it from the legal perspective, defended it in court, uh, was attacked by the US government for doing something so crazy that they copied it. Uh, uh, and I can tell you that I fully justify the use of that type of activity, but I would fight anyone who suggests that we use targeted killing against a murderer. For murderers, we have police forces. Targeted killing we use against terrorists against whom we have no other viable alternative. There's a lot of uh, conditions before we do that. But I would never allow that type of methodology in the concept of law enforcement. But in fighting terrorism, I think it is a justified balance. So the real reason why we need to have a <laughs> definition of terrorism, or reason number one, is because we want to do nasty stuff to terrorists that we would never do to regular criminals. However, Boaz, and this is where we actually differ, if that is the reason why we want the definition, you need to play in my area, because then it's a legal definition. And your definition is not good legally. Why? Because it has too many holes. I will give you an example. Uh, the word violence. What does it mean? In my classroom, Ori, you remember, I take you through the stages. Killing people I get. Trying to kill people I get. But I ask my students, if I slap Boaz in the face because he's Jewish, is that terrorism? If I curse you, is that terrorism? And the answer is probably not. And every person has a different threshold, which is why the UK, which came up, I think, with the best definition of terrorism ever, said significant violence. Now, what does significant mean? No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is that there's a threshold here, which for, as a lawyer, I need to put it. Otherwise, I've gone too wide. Okay? I use that as one example. Um, another example is who is a civilian? Now, we've had these discussions, but if it's going to be used as an alternative for the regular legal methodology, we need to be precise. So I retired from the army as a, as a colonel, right? I am still a reserve colonel. Am I civilian? Uh, does it matter if the army called me up for a meeting tomorrow? Does that change my status? When I was in the army, when I was at home, was I civilian? Um, how far do, is a policeman a civilian? Does it matter if he works in a country where the police are subject to the Ministry of Interior or to the Ministry of something else? These are questions, as a lawyer, I need to answer these questions. And that is, uh, these are examples of why no country adopted such a simplistic definition of terrorism because it is too simple for lawyers. We are, we are complicated people. That's why we are expensive. <laughs> now... You know, there's an argument, and again, Boaz is the expert, right? So this is fun for me. Um, when you have... That, that's a, a lawyer. He's <laughs> punching you and then give you compliments. So at the end of the day, you will pay the check. So what happens is, for example, you remember the famous argument, uh, is a terrorist act a terrorist act when perpetrated by a single individual? The lone wolf, right? What do we have against wolves? So... <laughs> The end of the day is, in the US, for example, for a while, they said if it's a sole perpetrator, it's a hate crime, it needs to be a group. It took the US a while to come to the conclusion that it is possible to have a terrorist attack by a sole individual. <coughs> FBI took some time on that. Um, other countries have still maintained that you need to be part of an organization in order to be a terrorist. Now, you can decide what you want, but you need to decide in order to be accurate and precise so that we can use it as lawyers to prosecute and do nasty stuff to the people we really think deserve it. So if that is the usage of the definition, Boaz, your, your definition is too simple. But there's another possible usage of that definition. And that possible usage is to create a coalition of like-minded states, people, individuals, organizations, and normal human beings who will come together and say, look, I don't think we can necessarily agree on every single syllable of the definition, but those are the bad guys. And we are all aligned together in a coalition against these bad guys. And what I think your 35 years of pushing for this definition has achieved it has forced the normal people of the world, the like-minded countries, etc., <coughs> to engage in this discussion and to try to 
align the positions as closely as possible so that we can jointly point together and say, yes, those are the bad guys together. And in that respect, the idea of having a joint definition is a great one. Just not if you want to use it for the real world legal purposes as opposed to the real world strategic political purposes. And I will end because I will use a little time. Um, it won't be the, today. <laughs> <laughs> there was a joke I was told uh, uh, when I was young um, about uh, the Israeli Institute of Technology in Haifa is called the Technion. And most of my friends went to study there because they were geeks like me, but I went to study law for some reason. And the problem with them is that they all were very shy. And because they were very shy, uh, they weren't good at you know, uh, uh, um, making moves on girls. So they would arrange dance parties at the Technion, but there are very few girls at the Technion and a lot of boys. <laughs> now, this is about do we need a definition and what I suggest we do. And the story goes that three students, one student of uh, physics, one of mathematics, and one of engineering, are standing on one side of the dance floor, and all the girls are on the other side. And they're scared to cross, and they're thinking what they should do. So uh, uh, the physics guy says, you know what, I have an idea. Let's make a step and go halfway. And then we'll make another step and go <laughs> halfway again. And we do it over and over. So the mathematics guy said, but you know, we'll never actually get there that way. And then the engineer said, but we'll get close enough. <laughs> and I think that's where we're going. I told you that I've chose a great debater, fair fight, not fair, but fight. No, no. Um, few uh, few answers to your to your arguments uh, first of all yes uh, I, I do argue that terrorism is different than the criminal activity although they do the same uh, as you have mentioned but you saw it in a bad eye you said okay so just because uh, we want to punish them uh, more harshly than the criminals we need the definition well it's not the case that's not the reason why we need we need to unify the international community around this definition because without that, we would never reach the level of international cooperation which is needed to contend with this phenomenon. Now, if you argue that the, on the only difference is the intention, here we want to, uh, 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 you have uh, criminals that want to achieve political goals and there you have criminals that want to have profit and that's the whole difference. Again, you are right. But as far as I know, and I'm a novice in this, this is your field, Mr. Lawyer, uh, as far as I know, the whole uh, criminal codex is based on top of many other things of, on intention. There is different intention for those who intended to kill the others and different punishment to those who didn't intend whoa, but, uh, whoa, 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 and whoa, killed. Whoa, okay? whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> the answer is no. Okay. No, this is a debate, so I can stop it. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I respect you. <laughs> <laughs> and because he knows I'll come after him afterwards. So, so the idea is this, but uh, uh, uh. Yes, criminal law includes intent. We call it, we use Latin mens because rea. we can charge more. So yeah. it's called mens rea, right? <laughs> but, but, but the reality is that intent, it's not the same type of intent we're referring to. Intent in law is a distinction between intentional act negligent act and unintentional act. That is intent in law. So we need to have some other intents. Wait, there okay. are very few offenses very... in which we also, we also add another element of why did they do it. But it is very rare in law because it is viewed as a bad way of approaching law because you don't know. So for example, if someone commits a crime in many, many cases in counterterrorism, believe me, you would know. You of would know I because know. because they, they want to say it, because there is no meaning for this criminal activity for them without saying. The reason why we succeed today with AI, with big data, and so on and so forth, to deal with lone wolves is just because they want <coughs> to say the, their intentions before they conduct the attack. I have to share you with you a story. It's, you, you would say it's, uh, it's irrational from their side, it's fanatic, whatever, but that's the way it, it goes. Let me share with you an anecdote. 
uh, a few years ago, I learned that in Lebanon, which is not necessarily the paragon of you know, democracy, uh, they have a law where when you commit a crime, you have, an, you have a, a, a punishment. But if you commit it for ideological and political reasons, which is what you get, you get half the punishment. I'm not surprised that it comes from Lebanon. Wait, yeah. But <laughs> interestingly enough, they copied this from some French logic. And when I researched why they would say this, and the answer was interesting, and it made me think, because I'm like you. I, for me, the terrorists are the bad guys. They said, look, a criminal knowingly violates a system he knows in order to make profit or something else. An ideological criminal thinks he is a good guy. And in fact, he thinks you are the bad guy. And therefore, in that respect, he, from such a subjective the position, is less of a bad guy the than the other way, criminals. The only way to persuade the ideological criminal that he's doing wrong is that its own society will come up and stand against him. If it's his own society doesn't differ between terrorism to other acts of violence, they would never stand against him. So you need to harness them and to bring them to the table. Now, you've said, fine, but we cannot, uh, we cannot influence, we cannot persuade anyone. They, what's the merit of that if we cannot persuade anyone to adopt that? Well, we can. Um, I can tell you, of course, uh, I, I had a lot of uh, conversations uh, through those 30 years with decision makers, but also with simple people, including Arabs, including Muslims, and including Palestinians. And including and lawyers. All, and, and including lawyers. <laughs> with the exception of one lawyer, they all said, that definition, <laughs> we adopt. We can live with that. That makes sense. Now, I, I fully agree with you, and actually, I, uh, I, know, <coughs> I learned this from you. Uh, I agree with you, this is not a legal definition. This is a political definition, but it's, a sm it's important enough to be a political definition to become a, a guidance for lawyers like you that will make a fortune out of it and translate it into the criminal codex and will give those translations insight. But at least is the Magna Carta. You, you put some kind of, uh, of a conceptual uh, um, normative a guideline that will be uh, uh, accepted by a lot of the people, the most of uh, most of the people around the world, and then you would have laws, and you would have uh, 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 so many interpretation of that that uh, 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 that you could live with them as a lawyer altogether. In a way, I would say that, uh, and, and maybe I would conclude with that, and I will give you the last uh, the last statement. You know, uh, again, I'm a novice in international humanitarian law, definitely when I'm standing as far as I can from you. Uh, um, <laughs> but the whole, the whole concept of the international, international humanitarian law, the way I understand it, is based on two uh, uh, norms that from that, all the, the, the laws of war have been extrapolated, uh, which is distinction and proportionality. Now, you know better than I do that you have huge problem with defining distinction and much bigger problem in defining proportionality. And yet those are the two norms that based on that, a lot of laws and, uh, and, and interpretation came after. I think that should be the same concept in this regard. And so I will end, and as you can see, Boaz and I have been friends for over 30 years. And Until I today. Could feel, yeah. <laughs> so I think what we can agree about is the following. Um, it makes perfect sense. In fact, I fully support the idea that we try to create a coalition of what I call like-minded people and countries. But at the same time, we need to be realistic. And what I think is unrealistic is to expect that other non-aligned countries, etc., will join us in this effort. And I, frankly, don't feel the need for that. I am not one of those people who believe if Everyone doesn't agree, then it doesn't work. For me, critical mass is the people I share values with. And if the countries and people we share values with will agree on your definition, any variation of it, for me, that's close enough. I think that the presidential candidates usually walk to the center and shake hands, so let's okay, do that. Okay.